So welcome back. Um, I'm going to start off with the slide we just finished at. So this is again Bio 212. It's review for test number two, chapters 19 through 21. And what I want to make sure you're not doing is simply looking at this and going, oh, this is only the material I need to know for the exam. Remember, I want to remind you, this is the material that I know I have seen students have a difficult time with. Okay, so I mean, they see it on an exam. They really weren't expecting to see it a specific way. They can maybe memorize that cardiac output is the amount of fluid that exits through the aortic valve at a specific volume. Great, but do you remember that you actually have um, psychological effects that change that? Remember, if you're thinking about going for a run, if you feel your heart rate increasing, that's your body accommodating the required change in cardiac output required for that. Okay, So this is the way that I want you to actually use this sort of review session. Okay. So next question. Let's go. A more reasonable question could be is, can you build a heart and don't forget to leave the connective tissue out? Okay, so thinking about what we did the last, if you actually looked at the previous review section and you got to the last question, you remember I had you guys draw a heart and that heart, of course, looks something like this. Okay, keep my hand away from the zoom in and zoom out piece to this. Okay, and notice what I'm asking here. I'm asking something slightly different. I'm asking, can you build it so you don't forget about the connective tissue. Remember the connective tissue is the electrical insulator between the atria and the ventricles. But also inside of this is the dense irregular connective tissue that we make our valves out of, right? So you actually have, the way it works is the pulmonary trunk sits on top of the aorta and you have the tricuspid and the bicuspid. And you actually have a path of blood flow. And I know you guys know this. I know I'm not going to have to worry about this. Okay, sorry I'm not savvy enough yet to figure out how to change the colors on the flies. We're looking at red and blue here, but you can see pretty much what we're doing here. And in this cartoon, you know, there's a couple things I want to point out to you. One of which is going to be that, you know, each of these arrows means something. The upper pulmonary trunk is going to go to a closed portal circulatory system, you know, as pulmonary circulatory pathways. Whereas the lower blue arrow here, that's your systemic circulatory system. And that's why it's important to remember that when we draw in, okay, we think about what it means to draw in. Whoa, I just erased the whole thing. Let's put that whole heart back together again. Let's go like that. Let's put our heart back together again. Woohoo! And you think about where the valves are and you know the different muscle thicknesses. Okay, you're thinking, why does Mother Nature put more cardiac myocytes here? It's to increase blood flow, but that's because it has to fight against total peripheral resistance. Okay, so for the circ this actual systemic circulatory system, there's an increased total peripheral resistance, which you don't encounter when you're sending materials to the right and the left lungs. It doesn't mean that there isn't some resistance there. It just means you can't send as much pressure there because you will destroy those capillary beds. Okay, cool. Now, what sounds do you hear? Well, is this a lub or is this a dub up here? Remember, it's the opening and the closing of the valves, so make sure you know which valves are opening and closing when you actually hear each of the sounds themselves. Okay. Let's see if I try this up here, what's going to happen when I do that? No, look at that, I erased it. Goodbye. Next slide. What are the mechanisms used to regulate heart rate and therefore cardiac output? What are the consequences of changing the preload to the atria of the heart? Okay, so there are two parts here. Um, the first is always going to be a mechanism. Um, and if we cut the, let's do this, let's do that, let's do that. What happens if we increase vagus stem or increase uh, cardiac accelerator nerve stem. Can you think your way through the consequences of this, right? And that also means that this is independent of what's going on inside the body. 
you can think yourself into slowing your heart slowing your heart rate I have you guys do that before every exam right you can think your way into stimulating your heart rate all you have to do is think test that makes sense okay what happens if we increase say proprioception pro proprioception Perception activation. What are our consequences here? Well, there's more movement inside the joints, and therefore you'd increase heart rate activity. All of these things go to change the actual heart rate. What's different, of course, is so if we're thinking about what proprioception activation actually means, actual moving is going to increase the amount of blood that's going to travel to the actual atria itself and it's not just the right atria although that's what I taught you inside class right because that would mean remember I had you stand up and sit down and what that meant is you actually had the musculature pushing more blood into the right atria but also because you're simply breathing and that breathing inside the closed chambers of the thoracic cavity changes pressure pressure and as that pressure changes of course you're now going to change the amount of blood that now returns to the left atria as well okay left atria a t r i a okay so this is what i mean when you're thinking about what changes the preload of the atria to the heart and of course now you have just slightly more volume returning to the ventricles and now you have more blood exiting the ventricles to support all of the need of the body itself both the circulatory and cardiac structures are regulated by the ANS, and I want you to compare and contrast these. I actually, in the summertime, make this a standalone question on a take-home exam, and what I want you to pay attention to, of course, is the fact that you have not only... Whoops, yeah, just make the whole bloody thing a heart. Just draw over it, right? Because the, this first part we've done a couple times now. SA node, AV node, we have dual innervation by both cardiac accelerator and vagus, dual innervation, cardiac accelerator nerve and vagus, but down here it's cardiac accelerator nerve by itself. So that's going to change the total amount of blood that actually exits into both the pulmonary and systemic circulatory system. But now let's think about what's different down here. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have multiple colors to make this pretty like I do inside the class, right? But blood is going to flow in oxygenated over here, right? And essentially, what I'm asking you is, do you understand that this is the Starling's law of the capillary bed? So oxygen is here, carbon dioxide is here. And do you remember that only cardiac accelerator nerves, which are sympathetic, regulate the vasoconstriction? Vasoconstriction. Whoops, I just erased the entire set of drawings. I got to learn how to use this bloody pen. Okay, so there's your heart up here again. All right, let's do this quickly. SA node, AV node, cardiac accelerator nerves just into the ventricles. SA, AV for both the vagus and the cardiac accelerator nerves. And what I was drawing down for you here the, just before I erased this accidentally, right, was the capillary bed. And that capillary bed, of course, was being regulated here by the sympathetic nervous system, SYNP, okay? And that means by either increasing or decreasing vasoconstriction, the more vasoconstriction, the faster the blood passes through the capillary bed, you actually have less materials being collected and transported. And remember what we're doing here, whoa, what's going on? Okay, what we're doing here is we are Let's go see if I can't fix this bloody thing. Ah, it doesn't seem like I'm having much luck with this. Zoom out. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. The pen actually has this weird handle on it, but whatever. I'm trying to make it work. Okay. Where was I going with this? I was going with the fact that it, the sympathetic nervous system, depending on vasoconstriction, is going to allow for the transcytosis of materials out through bulk flow. Notice the way I'm describing this. Bulk flow. B U. That's a U. Right. L. K. Flow. All right. 
you have transcytosis, so it passes. Here's, here's an endothelial cell, and something's underneath it coming out of the basement membrane, right? Imagine this is carbon dioxide moving in. So it's traveling from cells outside here into the endothelial cells to now travel inside the plasma of the blood to now be collected by a red blood cell where now hemoglobin will bind some of that carbon dioxide and move it through. That's a really important concept. You're, you're moving materials through cells in through different volumes of materials. Okay. So that's why there would be different. You don't actually see this piece inside the heart. Okay, next. Nine. If capillaries require a set pressure, what are the factors that can change that pressure? We've already identified those. Remember, sympathetic nervous system, vasoconstrictors, and vasodilators, primarily nitric oxide. Okay. So let's draw this quickly because I want to get this as the last set here. So let's go like this. Here is a capillary bed. You should be able to draw these in your sleep now. Maybe you even have nightmares about them. Yay. Who cares? Right? Boom. And notice I'm setting them up so there's some space in between them. The reason for that, of course, is we need materials to diffuse in and out. But what was the pressure on this side? Do you remember the net filtration pressure? That's what I'm asking you about here. That's what we're talking about. What causes a net filtration versus net reabsorption? Net reabsorption. It's an R pressure here. What's Mother Nature doing by making sure that this is a negative value? Did you see that when you saw it inside the book? Why didn't anybody ask me about that in class? Negative values mean things are moving down their pressure gradient, and this is why you actually get stuff to move back to the atria of the heart. Okay. Cool. So can you explain and identify the different pressure changes? So as you're moving in here, right, blood's moving in. I told you a moment ago we can, we can actually control vasoconstriction here if we use, say, epinephrine and norepinephrine, NE. Uh, norepinephrine. So that's what's supposed to be. It looks like two scribble marks. Okay, but don't forget, nitric oxide can also cause vasodilation. So you actually have some antagonism here. That makes sense? Cool. At least I hope it does. Let's do that. Ten. How do arteries and veins act similarly, differently, and which ones are regulated and how? So this is like the third time we're talking about how it is we actually are looking at the conduit systems. Notice I changed my vocabulary there. And I think I drew something like this inside class uh, where we actually have, let's put our heart here. I don't know why there's a lag in this now. But here's where we actually have materials into the systemic circulatory system. And in class, I would have changed colors, and this would be venous blood return, right? So this is actually coming from the left ventricle. This is going back to the right atria, RA, here, okay? And what I want you to do is now is think about how it is say an artery is built so literally be able to have all the basics in place and what do i mean by that is how many layers of intima or externa or media are found inside an artery okay versus that of a vein why is it we only find valves inside veins well that's because as you're returning from here to here meaning the capillary bed to the right atria the pressure is decreasing so you have high amounts of pressure here, so it becomes low amounts of pressure there, okay? But over here, you have high amounts of pressure as you're actually exiting the body, and it becomes lower. It never approaches, approaches zero. I mean, think about what the value is here, right? What is that value? We know what it is inside here. It's 35. See how long it takes that five to show up. 35 millimeters um, pressure. HG. That's not an HG. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, you can actually see how this is actually working, and now it sort of starts to make sense. Okay? 
Remember, each is going to be regulated slightly differently. Remember, all of our sympathetic innervation is occurring on this side here. Okay, so just one last thought before we move on to the last question, making sure you understand that you have to be able to build an artery in a vein, and then you need to be able to think about how the pressure changes as you're moving through the entire circulatory system I'm showing you here. Okay, cool. Let's do this last question then. Round one. So what are cardiac cycles? I'm just going to leave that as an open-ended question for you to think about, right? You're going to go inside your textbook. You're going to go, oh, okay, I got this really big figure inside here to think about. But when we're actually thinking about what a cardiac cycle is, what does it actually have to do with our cartoon? Okay. Remember inside your textbook, I told you they're paying particularly paying particular attention to the left ventricle. Now that you know that, how does that figure make more sense? Okay, this is going on a little bit longer than I wanted it to, but here are, so this is the last piece, but a couple of things I was thinking about while I was putting this together. I mean, things not to forget, right? You know, how do you actually build a heart? I know you have to learn for that for your practical, but don't forget that stuff for the exam. Remember, there's a fibrous outer connective tissue, and then deep to that is going to be the pericardial fluid and then you have the epicardium outside there and then you have the actual myocardium and you have the endocardium inside here what is that endocardium made up of that endocardial cushion is made up of what how do you build those valves what are they made of i've told you before but make sure you pay attention to that okay why does mother nature have them where they are these are some really basic things and remembering that the SA node, as it depolarizes, has a specific profile. The AV node has its own profile. If we do something like this, right, this is not meant to bring fear into your hearts anymore, right? It shouldn't have to. You can figure it out. You know exactly what's going on here. And this is the sum of all of the electrical activity throughout the entirety of the heart when compared to this. I drew one of these in the last presentation, right? When you're looking at, this is the individual depolarizations of a cardiac myocyte. This is the sum of, of that car cardiac depolarizations for all of the cells from the SA node all the way through to the end of ventricular repolarization over here. So I hope this stuff helps. Come to class prepared to ask questions and I'll answer them as best I can. Okay.